Cool. Okay, so um, so it's a super big pleasure to in, to uh, start this um, course by talking, giving you an introduction to NeuroPixels probes. Here's a NeuroPixels probe. It's about one centimeter long, and this is a thumb of a person. It took me a long time to understand that first time I saw it. Maybe I have some kind of problem in my vision. Um, and um, and so let, let's first introduce the people who created NeuroPixels probes and. Uh, um, the probes are an idea by Tim Harris, uh, who is a, um, a professor at Johns Hopkins and a scientist at uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Geneva Research Center. And he realized that lots of people were asking him for probes designed in different ways. And he thought, why don't we just have a probe that will satisfy everybody by putting sites all over the place? And so um, my understanding of how it happened is that he, uh, he needed about $4 million and uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute gave them some of that money to do this, uh, but said, you should go out and look for um, other sources of funds and other collaborators. Um, and this way they solved two problems. One was that this way they wouldn't spend the whole amount. And the other was that other institutions would also participate in, the, in checking whether this was a good idea or not. <laughs> and, and before uh, ponying up the rest of the money. And, um, and so the institutions that um, joined were the Allen Institute of Brain Science led by Christoph Koch and um, a team at UCL led by John O'Keefe. Um, and by the way, John was a, at his uh, at least second um, iteration of improvements on recordings, having been the inventor of the Tetrode. And Tim also had the brilliant idea to um, go talk to Baroon Data and colleagues at IMEC um, and IMEC is a really interesting special research center. Uh, it's a nonprofit research center in Flanders in Belgium. And Carolina, who's going, who's an engine, the key engineer there, and she's going to talk after me. I hope she'll say a few words explaining how IMEC works. Um, their day job is not to make electrodes. Um, hi, Carolina. Um, uh, their day job is to make semiconductors for the semiconductor industry. So from what I understand, but Carolina can correct me, the semiconductor industry has understood um, Moore's law a while ago and they make sure they obey it. And so they already know where they need to be in two and a half years um, and in five years and so on. And the people they ask to get there are people like IMEC. So, uh, so Intel will have IMEC get them to the next stage. Carolina, please correct me later if, if this is incorrect. And, um, and what else? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so IMEC then started uh, making uh, plans and, and, uh, and, and ran it by scientists. And of course we needed funders and the funders are Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Allen Institute, Wellcome Trust and Gatsby. So these are the funders for the NeuroPixels probe. So what was the state of the art when this project started? Um, here's a little graph showing the number of recording sites per shank. A shank is basically the thing you put in the brain, and one, you know, one shank of something. Um, and, um, and, you know, it started with uh, single electrodes, the, the metal microelectrode. Hubel had a very good one in 1953, um, which is illustrated here. It's metal in glass and only a tiny bit of metal sticks out of the glass and therefore can record. Then in the 80s, we got the tetrode. Um, this is a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. And, and then we got the 16-channel uh, silicon probe, um, which then became the 256-channel polytrode, which is illustrated here. And um, one thing that you may want to notice uh, right away is that, um, so the microelectrode is the recording site and the cable, right? the metal microelectrode. When you get to the polytrode, you see that what's happening here. Every little dot here is a um, recording site and every line is a channel that allows you to record from it. And this is a 256 uh, channel um, polytrode. Uh, and you can see what happens up here. The entire shank is taken up by uh, wires, by the channels. Uh, Nick, am I still doing okay? I need some feedback. You can hear yeah, me. Sounds great. I can hear okay. you fine. Am I being logical? <laughs> yes, I think so. Oh, okay, awesome. Except I'm not sure there are 256 sites on that probe. Other than that, I think so. Yeah, you're right. That's probably a 64 channel. You guys can count it. Anyway, you can see that it's filled up with um, channels. And 
At the same time, um, there were these chips which were around uh, for sure <laughs> at that time, and the wires in there were about 10 microns. Um, sorry, 0.01 microns, so 10 nanometers, okay? And instead, in the polytrode, the wires were 1.5 microns, okay? So uh, two orders of magnitude bigger. And of course, in the old days, it was a five micron kind of thing. And so what Tim Harris and Baroon and colleagues um, uh, tried and understood was that it was necessary to go from this 1.5 micron towards this direction, okay? Um, that doesn't mean that they got there, um, um, wait, which screen am I sharing? Can you see my, my... We see your pointer as a little red dot and we see the full slide and nothing else. Okay, good. Okay. So, uh, okay, good. And so, you know, they wanted to go in this direction and try to, 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 um, you know, bridge this gap and they managed to get halfway. Uh, meaning they did something that was half in, in, in where the wires are about a tenth of this and about 10 times this, okay? Um, so here's the NeuroPixels probe. Um, here's um, the probe and I'll, I'll go into the details of it. Um, and this is where it stands in the, in the grand scheme of things. It's got about a thousand channel uh, sites um, and um, it appeared in 2017. Um, and the sites are spaced by about 20 microns and they have this geometry here, which is designed to try to optimize the number of neurons that are recorded. And you can see that clearly it's probably not going to be the last word in this business. <laughs> There's never a last word, but anyway, um, because clearly electronics can go way thinner and more compact. So the, 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 the cell phone that you have in your pockets, um, Carolina will tell us how wide the wires are in the semiconductors in there. And I bet they're, they're way smaller than 10 uh, nanometers, okay? But what's the problem with cell phones? Cell phones get really hot. And Baroon uh, Dutta, the, the chief engineer at IMEC, um, explained to me that the reason why they keep on getting bigger and bigger is not because people want, or at least not only because people want large screens, but also because um, the larger they are, the better they dissipate heat. And uh, when we, you know, as a team designed the NeuroPixels probes, we had to, to decide um, how much temperature is okay. And we actually have no idea to this day, how much can you heat the brain without it being a problem? So we set this completely arbitrary um, number, which was that the, the, the shank should not heat by more than one degree Celsius. And in the end, the engineers at IMEC uh, obtain the design where the shank heats by much less than one degree Celsius. So we're, we're happily in there. And, um, and so it is possible that future generations will have thinner wires and, and uh, they will get a bit hotter. And maybe you guys in the audience will be the scientists who understand how much hotter they can get without it being a problem. Okay, so let's, let's give a look now at the NeuroPixels probes. And I'm, I apologize if you already know all this. This is a very introductory, introductory lecture. So there is a shank that, has, that is one centimeter long. And there is a thing called the base, which is this uh, piece of semiconductor, which is also one centimeter long and um, has got some width. The base does most of the work because it takes signals that are analog from a thousand, well, actually from um, um, 384 of the thousand sites. So the base selects 384 out of those thousand sites records from them, meaning it gets analog signals from it, amplifies them, divides them into two bands, one for LFP, one for spikes, um, so low frequencies and high frequencies, digitizes them, and then what comes out is fully digital. It could in principle go into a laptop, but what this probe speaks is not a language that a laptop would understand because a laptop would understand USB or Firewire or some, some protocol. And but what comes out of the probe is not a protocol that a, a laptop would understand. Therefore, you need to go into another uh, digital box that will change the digital language, but it's already digitized. You do not need an amplifier. You, do, you basically don't need a lab. Just to give you an idea, an amplifier with a hundred channels used to be a hundred thousand dollars. And now this probe is a thousand euros and it's got 384 channels already digitized and amplified. So it's big change. This is what the probe looks like in electron microscopy, I believe. 
um, though. And then, um, okay, so what kind of thing? Uh, well, first of all, what is the fantastic advantage of this probe also in terms of manufacturing? That this thing plus this are just the same silicon that would have been produced to make a chip. Okay, so here's an illustration. Again, it took me a long time to understand what I was looking at. Um, this is one of these sheets of semiconductor that are commonly produced when you make semiconductors. And this rectangle here is the base. And this thin thing here is the actual NeuroPixels probe. And there's this extra stuff. I have no idea what it is. It's probably stuff that um, they put, they fabricate at the same time because it's convenient to do so because there's empty space. Um, and Carolina maybe can explain that too. I'm giving you a lot of things to explain. <laughs> anyway, so after this, um, uh, after all this work, uh, a lot of collaborators worked in testing and creating these probes and um, in testing them. It's a long list of authors. Um, the paper came out in 2017. And, um, and so just, I wanna start by showing you a, a, a few of the results that we got um, with this, um, um, with, with these probes. Here's an example of a penetration that goes through primary visual cortex, um, CA1 in hippocampus, dented gyrus, um, and LP um, thalamus. And so um, you can see here it's about 3,000 uh, microns. And um, you know, you can look at the RMS amplitude of the spikes in microvolts, the firing rate in spikes per second, how much gamma power there was at different depths, how many single neurons you got in different depths, and what was the visual modulation index, because we were showing visual stimuli, which of course was strong in primary visual cortex, um, not there in CA1 and dented gyrus, and strong again in this visual thalamus, this is secondary thalamus. And then you can plan at, at this point, um, trajectories of your desires, basically. And the funny thing also is that often these trajectories end up going through places that you didn't think you were interested in. So imagine a visual neuroscientist was doing this experiment. They would probably aim for V1 and LP. They wouldn't care for CA1 and then Tejerits, but it's on the way. You might as well record from it and you make discoveries. And in fact, we have in the lab made discoveries that way. And so, and he can create um, uh, penetrations that to suit everybody's uh, pleasures. Uh, this is mouse brains. So uh, the, the mouse brain is smaller than one centimeter. Therefore, the, um, the, the NeuroPixels probe is even slightly too long, um, unless you insert it really sideways, um, lengthwise. And so here's the penetration that would have made me happy 20 years ago. Primary visual cortex going through to lateral geniculus nucleus. Here's one that would make a motor neuroscientist happy, primary motor cortex going through caudate putamen. And here is one that might make a more um, cognitive person maybe uh, happy, a prelimbic uh, cortex going through caudate putamen and through basolateral amygdala. Um, I see questions or are we good? I, I think we're good. Yeah. Okay, I saw something flashing. Okay, so here is also, you can of course then insert two NeuroPixels probes at once. And this is an experiment that uh, Nick did um, uh, and in which he inserted two probes, one in here and one in there in the mouse brain. Um, and he obtained about 750 neurons in total in all these structures. Uh, this is the classical raster where every row is a neuron and every blip in time is a spike. And, and, and so again, this is unprecedented. My own PhD uh, in 1995 was about 200 neurons and it took about five years. And this was 750 neurons and it took an afternoon, maybe less than an afternoon. Um, and um, and so, so this is the kind of game changing uh, that these probes have uh, allowed. And so some statistics, um, you, can, uh, you can say for these, these various different structures, uh, sensory cortex, uh, thalamus, uh, various layers of the hippocampus, cerebellum, etc. cetera, um, how many neurons are you able to get per structure with one uh, NeuroPixels probes? And it can vary a lot. You can go from 200 here um, to, you know, very few, where is that? the granular layer because it's thin um, of the hippocampus. But in general, you have high efficiency, uh, meaning you're not wasting sites. You, 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 you tend to have almost always one well-isolated neuron per site. Um, and well, let's look here. This is interesting. The converse is when you have uh, how many sites, sorry, the spikes of one neuron 
are they going to, are, on how many sites are they going to appear? And the answer is pretty much always around 10, which is great. That means uh, it really helps in the spike sorting um, uh, process. Again, I'm staying very general in this talk. Uh, we will go into the details of all of this as the course uh, goes on. So then these probes up to now, I showed you examples of uh, acute in implants in which um, the animal is head fixed and the probe goes in and then a couple of hours later it comes out. But of course, one can also do chronic recordings. Here a chronic record is in rat, um, in which the probe is going through secondary motor cortex um, and then going down the medial bank. Um, and, um, you know, there's nice spikes uh, that last this is how many spikes per second um, and they last for many days. That doesn't mean that it's the same um, neurons. We will then go into the business of whether you're recording from the same neurons across days and the answer is you can. Um, and so this is an example of an implant in a rat and also the, uh, we showed an, uh, in that paper um, uh, implants in which you go and do, you know, again, penetrations that would be really hard to do otherwise in which you go through internal cortex and you can find um, lots of activity in rats that are moving around uh, with grid cells. Um, and so, and then the cool thing also for me, at least because I work in mice, is that you can also do um, um, uh, chronic recordings in mice. So this is a picture from the 2017 paper. And as you can see, it was a very large implant, uh, light, but very bulky in terms of uh, the size of the mouse. Not too bulky because the mouse is happy to stand up and do all sorts of things, um, but still, um, you know, something that we could improve, but also you can see that we were able to record very nice spikes um, and that uh, the total firing rate stayed not too bad uh, for about, you know, 150 days, which is six months. Um, and now let's, let me get slightly into uh, some, some technical issues and also a fa false direction in which we went briefly, um, which was the issue of whether uh, the sites should be amplifying or not. I told you that the amplification is done in the what we call the base, which is the thing that sticks out of the brain. Um, but briefly, we considered um, doing the amplification at the sites, which of course would be possible um, uh, because this is a semiconductor. And so it's like when you have a camera, um, there is amplification happening at each pixel. Um, and hence the name NeuroPixels. So it turns out that doing active sites was not helpful from the point of view of recordings and was very unhelpful from the point of view of light sensitivity. So now I'd like to get into the business of light sensitivity and optogenetics very briefly. So here are examples um, of experiments in which we would shine the light on, um, a blue light, um, and I'll get into what mouse, what types of channel rhodopsin, etc. Um, uh, but in this case, there was no light, uh, no, no channel rhodopsin. This was just a regular um, mouse that should have given no response to uh, light. And you can see that in the amplified case of the probe, when the probe was a, a prototype that you can't buy in the shops, okay, we, we stopped producing that. Um, we, we didn't even go into production. Um, there was this artifact. And then when we went to passive probes, the artifact was much smaller. So the amplified probes um, gave uh, substantial artifacts, even at very low light intensity, whereas the passive probes required uh, much higher light intensities to give comparable artifacts. So from now on, the engineer, from that point on, the engineering went towards the passive probes. And now I'd like to talk about these artifacts, which you might encounter, actually you will encounter, when you do optogenetic stimulation. Um, so first of all, this gives you an idea of the ranges of, of light intensities in milliwatts per uh, square millimeter. And here is an example of uh, what happens with different um, uh, waveforms of optical stimulation. Um, and we can see that, so here you have different waveforms, ramps, raised cosines, pulses, and long pulses. And here you have four sites in the action potential band, which are here, sites 1, 100, 200, and 300. And here you have examples of the same sites, but with the LFP band. And you can see an artifact in all of them, okay? But mostly you see it for the largest amount of light power, which is uh, 10 milliwatts at the tip. 
And, um, and you can see that some waveforms are better than others. For example, the raised cosine doesn't give you any artifactual quote unquote spikes, okay? Um, also, you will hear from um, Maxime Bo various methods in, in which you can, you know, not rec uh, you know deal with the artifacts and still do fantastic optogenetics at the same time as uh, recordings. Um, let me show you two examples of optogenetics during recordings. Um, one is an example in which we had channel rhodopsin in, in mostly layer four excitatory neurons, and we used. Um, some kind of Gaussian or raised cosine uh, light waveform. And you can see this is the firing rate in spikes per second. Um, and in layer four, you get a lot of spikes. Uh, this, uh, and, um, and here you can see the LFP. And the good news is that the LFP is mostly happening in this region where you get spikes. There's not tremendous amount happening uh, outside. And if you saw tremendous amounts of stuff happening outside, that would be an artifact because there is no cortex there. That's um, um, no, here, especially that's white matter. Um, and this is an example in which we used um, rapidly oscillating light to, to drive uh, parvalbumin positive inhibitory neurons, which of course has the effect of shutting down the cortex, as you can see here, and creates this LFP at the frequency of the light stimulation. Now there's a big deal out of spike sorting, which we will hear about. Um, and so basically you go from raw data like this in which stuff happens on different certain sites and you need to assign which neuron spiked when, and this is the process of spike sorting and I'm not gonna go into the details um, except to show this video, which might end up being too jerky. Um, is it too jerky, um, Nick? It's all right, I get the point. All right. Okay, so this is just a gazillion waveforms of a gazillion neurons that Nick recorded in primary visual cortex. And each color shows you a unit and it appears on two rows, two columns, because NeuroPixels probes have two columns. And it just keeps on going. This is one recording, spike sorted, and you're just seeing one average waveform per neuron that was recorded. And at the end, if we're patient, we'll see where they all fit. I don't know how patient we need to be. What do you think, Nick? Is it almost done? Yeah, I'm gonna keep it going. Yeah, I think I still is. Yeah, here they are. Okay, that's the whole uh, probe. So again, this kind of thing that four years ago was insane, and now five years ago, and now it's normal. Okay. Um, so let's give a look now at ground truth. How do we know that these are actual neurons and not some figments of the imagination of some software, right? Which is true of every recording we do, by the way, when we insert an electrode in the brain. And so uh, luckily we can use ground truth. Um, and here is an example of a beautiful um, study done by uh, Marcus Smith and others. Uh, we appeared in BioArchive 2018. Um, and um, they did cell attached recordings with a glass pipette and at the same and so they recorded these spikes like this and at the same time recorded from neuropixels probes right next to that and so great news is that the spikes of uh, of course you can then synchronize and ask how many spikes that i actually recorded for sure did appear on neuropixels and the, and the good news is that you can they appear in neuropixels very well and they cover about 30 sites which is lovely and i think we will use these data uh, to train ourselves in spike sorting um, uh, tomorrow. So, okay, so that's good news. Then uh, there is another uh, challenge, which is after you've done your recordings, you need to decide uh, where they were, right? So you insert them and you plan the penetration. We'll see tools to plan that penetration. Uh, but and then you need to reconstruct where the hell they were, the, these probes. And uh, so one trick is to dip the dye, uh, the probe in dye eye or in some dye, um, and then reconstruct where in the 3D um, space of the brain. This is a mouse brain, so we can use the common coordinate framework from the Allen Institute uh, to reconstruct where it was in there. And, and we will hear about that, those methods. And once you're done, you can have lots of penetrations in the same mouse, 
um, and, uh, and reconstruct where they were uh, with a certain confidence. For example, um, you can say, so this is probe one, which is, I don't know, I can't tell color that well, but anyway, it's one of these, um, it, it has to be back there. Uh, and, you know, with certain confidence, no, probe one, secondary motor cortex, so it must be in the front, um, maybe this one. Um, and you can see with certain confidence that in the beginning you were in secondary motor cortex, then you go in, the, in orbital and the olfactory and so on. Yeah, it must be one in the front. And, uh, and some uh, brain regions are tiny, so you will have low confidence that you've actually hit them. So uh, once you have this, you can do the kind of experiments that Nick did for his actual a day job when he was a postdoc in our lab, which was to actually record from the brain during behavior. And he recorded from 10 mice, about two probes per mouse on average, I believe, uh, and recorded from about 30,000 neurons. And this is the kind of results that I think represent a new normal going on. And also the Dysteroth lab had similar results around the same time, and in which you record, you, you know, you record from a ton of regions, um, you know, 857 neurons in reticular nucleus and, uh, you know, 914 in caudic putamen and that kind of um, scale. And that was, uh, you know, impossible before. And that makes you actually make discoveries because you go into regions. I, I, many of these regions have acronyms that I didn't know, Zona Inserta and so on. And they ended up being the most interesting places where we actually recorded it. And we, wouldn't, we, we would have not put electrodes there unless they happen to go there, which is what happens with neuropixels probes. Um, so just a quick glimpse at the future um, in, and the neuropixels 2 project. Do I still have a little bit of time? You have uh, just about 10 minutes. Um, depends on if you want to leave. Oh, time yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll take five minutes at most. So um, I want to introduce the future of NeuroPixels, which is the NeuroPixels 2.0 probes and the NeuroPixels Opto probes. Um, and so first I need to explain uh, the complex geometry of alliances. Um, so the NeuroPixels 2.0 probes, which I'll explain in a minute what they do, uh, are the results of um, collaboration with uh, Howard Hughes, um, Champagny Mode, Nerf, and Kavli. Um, this is driven again by Tim Harris. Uh, and so this core group here is funded by Wellcome Trust and UCL. And so this core group here, of course, relies on guess who, um, Data and Mora Lopez and team at IMEC. And so IMEC, this core group and these collaborators are developing NeuroPixels 2.0. And then again, IMEC, this core group and the Allen Brain Science Institute are developing NeuroPixels Opto. So what are NeuroPixels 2.0 and Opto? So the 2.0s, uh, let's start with Opto because um, it's easy. Um, so Opto basically will have the ability to shine light of two different wavelengths every once in a while on a shank, okay? And uh, most likely the wave, the light would be produced by lasers that are on board. And, but this is unlikely to become a product anytime soon because we only have funding to make a pilot of them, which will appear next year. And then we will need extra funding to go to uh, commercialization. Um, and by the way, commercialization is always at cost. So nobody's making money here. Every, all the institutions involved are nonprofits. Um, and, um, and then now let's talk about NeuroPixels 2.0. So this is the current probe, the NeuroPixels 1.0. And you can see that it has a fairly large base, one centimeter by something. And then it has one shank. And as I told you, it has a thousand sites. And out of them, you choose 384 channels that you can record at any given moment. So the NeuroPixels 2.0 probes are going to have three versions. This is the current plan, um, of, but they might change. Um, one version that is just like the NeuroPixels 1 probe, but with a smaller base, about a third the area. Still one shank, a more sites, 1,250, because they're more densely packed, and same number of channels. Then there will be a version that has the same size of base, but it will have four shanks and therefore 5,000 channels. 
but you will still have to choose 384 channels, okay, out of these 5,000. And then there will be a version, most likely, that will have the same size of the base as NeuroPixels 1.0, but four shanks, 5,000 sites, and you will be able to choose 384 of them per shank, bringing you to over 1,500 as a total. Now, this should be commercialized in 2022. We're already in beta testing and it's looking great. Um, and so by the time, you know, you blink, it will be 2022 and you'll be able to get them. So let me tell you a few more things about these NeuroPixels 2.0. I'm going to be showing you pictures that come from a um, fence poster. Uh, and it's a paper in preparation by Nick and collaborators. Uh, first of all, this is what the NeuroPixels 2.0 look like. You can see that everything has been miniaturized, not only the base, which is much smaller, but also every aspect of the ribbon and the, and the um, head stage, I guess this is called. Um, and also, now that you have these four shanks, which are more visible here, you can do experiments that would have been impossible before. For example, here's a recording, um, I believe from Nick's lab, in which he had four, the four shanks, which are separated by 250 microns each, by the way. Um, and they are inserted at the same time in caudate putamen. And when you do that, you can see these waves of activity, and here, here are 154 neurons sorted in the order of this traveling wave. Um, and I don't know what you're pulling here. What's the pull, Nick? Uh, this was from Dudman Lab, and it's a, an awake mouse uh, pulling on a lever as part of some motor behavioral okay. test. Josh Dudman uh, Lab at Janelia, and there's a mouse pulling something. And at the time of pulling, you can see this wave of activity before and and um, and after the pull, and it's highly repeatable. And it's the kind of wave that you could see if you record at the same time from lots of places. Um, and also, we can do these kind of uh, experiments in which you insert two four shank probes. So you have eight shanks in. You can't really record from 10,000 at the same time because some of them are out of the brain of a mouse. They, they're not going to fit. But you have 6,000 at the same time and you record from seven, six, eight at a time. And so this is now recording from 6,000 neurons done seven, six, eight at a time over eight sequential recordings. Uh, so, sorry, 6,000 sites. Um, so it's gazillion neurons. And, uh, and this is, again, going to be fairly normal in a couple of years. And uh, I just want to give a couple more highlights. Uh, one is the fact that with these, with these new probes, there's going to be an improved uh, geometry. The sites will be closer to each other and they, and they will be aligned instead of being scattered. This allows us to undo the movement of the brain. And this movement of the brain um, it, exists both in natural conditions, um, uh, which I'm showing here, um, and also, uh, in, uh, and we need to undo them, undo the movement, and we can undo it when you, we have sampling that is so tight on, because the movement is always pretty much orthogonal to the probe, or parallel to the probe, apologies. Um, we can undo it essentially with the same method that you would use for image registration. And so uh, Nick has this ingenious method in which he record, by the way, this data that you see here is a blow up version of the data here. Um, and this method that he has is to first record when the brain is doing its own movements and then impose movements, as you can see here with an oscillation, you can see it best down here, uh, and then stop. And then we, we use this, um, a new algorithm called KiloSort2 that Marius Pacitario developed, and he'll tell us about it, which has this motion correction. And so this will be the algorithm that we will use uh, tomorrow to, to spike sort. Um, and uh, it has this motion correction baked in. And once you undo the motion correction, um, you end up with traces that look like this and uh, spikes that instead of jumping up and down, uh, they all appear at the same height. Um, and one last little advertisement about uh, something that Anna Lebedeva will talk about tomorrow, I, I think, tomorrow, or the third day. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Um, and, um, and, so, and it is about recording chronically um, from the same neurons over weeks uh, using NeuroPixels 2 probes. And the way we know that it's the same neurons for weeks 
is that we are recording in primary visual cortex and we're showing a battery of images, over a hundred images to the neurons. And the neurons are picky about which images they like and which images they don't like. For example, neuron 20 might respond to image five, image 14, and then image, I don't know, 90. But, but unit 21 will have very different preferences. And this, um, we don't think it's going to change over time that much. And so we can use it as a signature to ask whether day after day we're recording from the same neurons. So Anna Lebedeva will explain these graphs much better than me, but basically we can ask, uh, given the unit index on day 14, and we have say 500 neurons in day 14, uh, who's the best matching neuron on day 15 in terms of signature of visual preferences? And for most neurons, it's the same neuron, okay? Meaning neuron 200 is the best match for neuron 200, so neuron 200 on day 15 is the best match for neuron 200 on day 14 um, because this very thick thing is actually a sequence of dots. Uh, and then there are a few outliers which are shown here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine outliers out of say 500. And these are the neurons that were not best matched by themselves. Um, and so in the beginning you have, you know, if you have a distance of one day between recordings, you have about 100% stable units. And then if you go about, you know, a month later, um, the stable units can go from, you know, as high as 90 or as low as 40%. Um, and of course, there's a big question there, which is if you were in a brain region where you don't know if you have the same neurons or not, how are you going to know if they're the same neurons or not? Because here in V1, we can use this trick, but in region blah that you're interested in, you're not going to be able to use this trick. And this is science that we're doing right now, and it'd be interesting to, uh, to also hear your opinions. And so I just want to show one last slide, which is going back to the roots and back to the people who um, created NeuroPixels probes, because uh, we should keep that in mind. And so all of this was due to Tim Harris and Christoph and John. And then uh, these guys at IMEC are actually the people who are doing the probe. And it's going to be super fun to hear from Carolina. Um, and um, and uh, we should also remember our funders. So thanks, and I will take questions if there are, and then we will have Carolina talk after me.